Hi everyone, uh, hope you guys are well. It's been a bit of a break, but welcome back to the Art Lounge Talks. Um, we are now on our 15th session. I can't believe it, time has really flown. It feels like only yesterday that I started these talks. Um, today we have a very special guest, a very talented guest, and her name is Saba Kizilbash. She is a visual artist, a researcher, and an educator. And uh, we are very excited to have her on board and ask her lots of questions about her work, uh, her practice, um, and her experience in this field. So I'm going to be adding Saba to this live session right now. Hi, Travis. Hi, Sabah. How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> I'm very fine. Well. Uh, it's always doing? tricky in Dubai connecting to uh, IG Live. So, I'm, yeah. And you've managed to get, which I, I, I'm off. Yeah, I know all of these WhatsApp and IG and all that. Yeah. This is a bit tricky, right? That's Definitely. correct. But, uh, <laughs> but it just adds to the excitement that, you know, it worked. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I'm really excited and really excited to see you as well. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just give a quick introduction of yours and then okay. we'll move on to like the interview part of it. Okay, so um, Sabah Kizilbash was born in Lahore and raised in Abu Dhabi, UAE. She has a BFA in painting from the National College of Arts, Pakistan, a master's degree in art education from the Rhode Island School of Design, and an MFA from the Ruskin School of Art, University of Oxford. Um, Kizilbaj is a recipient of the Vogue Hong Kong Woman Artist Award, the UC Berkeley South Asian Artist Award, the Mansfield Raddick Prize, and Pembroke Emery Prize awarded by the University of Oxford for an outstanding degree show. Amazing. Um, in addition, Kizilbaj has been the finalist for the Sovereign Asian Art Prize from 2017 to 2020, and has been awarded fellowships with Salma bin Thamdan Al Nehan Foundation for the Arts in partnership with the Rhode Island School of Design as well as the Paul Mellon Center for British Arts. Kizil Pasha's work has been showcased in the UK, UAE, Hong Kong, San Francisco, New York, and Pakistan, and she weaves and works her way through many borders, but mostly lives in Dubai. Is that correct, Saba? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Saba. You, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, fine. Perfect. Perfect. So, okay, Saba. So let's start from the very beginning. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how it has um, influenced your My art? background is uh, through and through the arts, basically. I mean, uh, ever since I was in eighth grade, yeah. ninth grade, I had made up my mind that I wanted to study. Uh, I wanted to be a studio artist. And since that day, I focused my okay. all my energies in this direction. So, um, in terms of my personal really? history, um, I'm raised in Lahore. Do not have any artists in my family per se, um, but that never discouraged me because my inspiration was really coming from deep within. Uh, and then I went ahead to National College of Arts. I just mentioned, mm -hmm. and once you are an NCA, there's uh, no looking back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wonderful. And so uh, coming to NCA, like you, you know, you've earned degrees from really prestigious institutions. Um, so the Rhode Island School of um, Design, National College of Arts and Ruskin School of Art, Oxford. Um, so firstly, how has your education shaped your artistic practice? And also, do you believe that an art education is essential to becoming uh, a successful You know, um, often in our field of art, uh, it, there is a perception that it is a very uh, self-reflective uh, field. It is very therapeutic, or it may be a lot of your creative genius involved, and it, it's also luck. So we attribute a lot of uh, success in this field to um, things beyond our practice and our control and our efforts. But it's not like that. Uh, yes. There has to be a huge amount of training in this field uh, Jessica in all the stem subjects like math and, and engineering and sciences 
there is a foundation that is laid you understand the anatomy you understand how cells work and how the body operates similarly in the art yeah. you, you need to be trained in the foundations of the principles that in the making and the techniques and the the challenges and then the mentoring from your professors so in that sense education in art is 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 very very crucial um in my in my yeah. case i began with yeah. a a degree a master's degree in art education from RISD Rhode Island School of Design I uh, at that time right. I was keen to uh, work in the community um and I was under the impression that okay. art is something I can I can improve I can build my practice on my own in the studio but I tell you Shanze I couldn't have been further away from the truth uh an MFA is a really, really I mean if you are lucky to be part of a difficult afford because it's very expensive as well but an mfa is a very uh, yeah. is a wonderful platform can be a wonderful platform for uh artists who want to pursue it as a career to really develop their ideas yeah. and their 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 practice and align the two uh what they are trying to say with what they are yes making wo alignment and yeah. i think it through bahut achhi tarike se aa jati hai um And do you feel that happened in your work after your MFA? Did your work? You know, in my case, uh, I went back to college very recently for my MFA. So Ruskin School of Art, which is a, a department within the University of Oxford, uh, happened last year. I graduated last year, and I was one of the uh, one of the three senior people in the program because the rest of them were in their twenties and recent graduates. Um, but you. you Them, uh, do not underestimate how young twenty years, twenty year olds look. And uh, so there was, I was very aware of uh, uh, the age gap. I was aware of uh, my kids being back in Dubai. I had left them there. Um, so, uh, but it was, uh, it was very, it was an amazing experience because I came with a lot of experience, and I came with a lot of clarity to the program. I was very sure of what I wanted to get. from the program not necessarily in terms of what i wanted to create at the end of the program that was just open and vague but for me uh, my motivation level was really high up you know okay okay yeah yeah okay i see i see yeah. um and was this a one year uh, school of art is uh, has a and one year mfa program it's it's extremely intense so there is no time to breathe or sleep or eat uh so there is this back to back uh tutorials back to back uh seminars and so uh in like in most uk institutions uh, ruskin also has the tutorial system where you work uh, almost uh, you work one on one with your professors uh so it's very intense you do not get to hide behind any uh anyone in your class <laughs> you are there and you have to, you're confronted and challenged constantly ke okay, what is this you're making with your audience why think about other approaches so there is a lot of challenge they were constantly challenging us right right absolutely and coming to the themes of your work um so your work explores themes of identity borders and belonging um can you tell us more about these themes and how they inform your art and why um, you work with these themes well uh, uh, a few i would say around Eight years ago, I used to work in uh, uh, acrylics, and I used to paint on canvas. And uh, there was a big switch in my practice. I just stopped painting, and I picked up a pencil, and I started to draw. Um, and mm -hmm. I think when I started to draw again, I began to look at um, my personal challenges. Um, and as most pakistanis we are often challenged by the situation of visas and access and entries and the kind of conversations we have as oh mujhe to itne saal ka visa mil gaya mera wahan ka bhi visa ka wait it's a common conversation no matter uh, uh, definitely from a privileged uh, uh, class this is not a conversation for everyone i am aware of my privilege but also like the people who are who are uh, constantly looking at middle east for work visas ke visa lagne wala hai ke nahi laga ke kitni der ka laga so there's always this whole question it is so, such a part of our vocabulary and that has has yeah. um, 
shaped my research as well access and entry points and uh checkpoints and um uh, uh, routes as well and that's how i arrived to to this uh, present research and i mean i must say so i haven't have had the privilege of seeing your work in person but in photographs i'm just blown away supremely detailed you know large scale works or even tiny graphite drawings and you know your the landscapes are like merging seamlessly and your cityscapes so can you describe your artistic process from conceptualization to execution and also tell us a little bit about this variation in yeah, scale so, in your work so um, i always begin with a curiosity all my drawings have concept i conceptualized all my drawings my large landscapes based on some point of curiosity whether it was coming across a a state a, a term in the newspapers that said enemy properties and i was like what do they mean when they say enemy properties in india or in pakistan or when i came across um whenever i've come across interesting things like reopening economic corridors or uh, religious corridors between india and pakistan so there has always been a point of uh, curiosity that has led me to pursue certain uh, um historical events that took place between uh, within our region and from that point i i start to visualize and conceptualize a landscape based on that research for example very recently uh when i was at the victoria albert museum i was i was there as part of my uh, uh graduate fellowship program at Paul Mellon Center for British Arts and we were brought in front of uh, Tipu's tiger in the, one of the showcases which which is uh, uh, a wooden automaton that is a piano as well once you open it it's a tiger mauling a a a, a British soldier so i mean these objects can uh, yeah. create a huge level of curiosity in me and then i go back to my studio and i read and i spend months often weeks or months researching uh not mm. academically as such but more for creating a visual language of what i'm trying i'm going to use that uh research for and from that that point i uh yeah, yeah. once that is done i read the books i've understood the issues at hand i use uh photoshop to stitch together images i work on photoshop to bring together a landscape based on scavenging for digital images online uh i bring it together as mm. seamless as possible like in when the pencil drawing part starts which everyone assumes is going to must yeah. be very hard and must take a lot of time that process is actually what takes me the least amount of time because it, yeah because it's become such really? a part of my muscle memory that the drawing flows very fast uh it fl- it flows i reach a stage of uh, hyper focus and the image is the drawing part is very fast but what takes me time is identifying the root you know in my drawings because those of you who are familiar with my practice i deal with um, all sorts of uh, travel routes yes 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 so so basically you piece them together but have you ever made something where you're kind of like where it's more spontaneous and you're kind of deciding in the moment that acha let me add this to it because that's how i work sometimes like sometimes i decide i plan everything but other times i just go with it and do you ever work that way yeah, my process, process is definitely more planned, more planned but what happens is that sometimes when i finish a drawing or when i'm maybe 80% through a drawing i realize that the visual balance is off or what i visualized on my computer screen and how it's turning out on a 7 feet drawing the visual balance is not really uh working for me so i will i will erase an area and i will go over it and i'll add another island or i'll add another highway or i'll add debris or ships or something to visually balance it and look at it from a distance to play with the contrast because in graphite drawings yeah. uh, value plays a huge part because it's all grayscale so for that i need to i need to have Lord. executed a major chunk of the drawing to stand back in my studio and see uh and that happens towards the end of the drawing mm-hmm. and what about scale like is that just something that you're doing because you are you want to be experimental and ex- you know 
uh, explore different scales or is, does that have something behind it? Like there's yeah. tiny work and there's really massive work. And I'm sure there's work in there. There are large pieces uh, often when people actually come, uh, eventually come to the gallery and the show is up, uh, they're often surprised by how large the pieces are and how digitally and on Instagram this, they yeah. appear because they're so minute and I'm holding a pencil and I'm, and I'm often seen with a tiny tool in my hand. There's an assumption that they must be miniature size. I do make, I do make small drawings, but I make them really large. Uh, and these seven feet wide yeah. drawings, six feet wide, five feet is usually my minimum. It is not a conscious uh, decision to make them at this scale. They start to expand and I okay. keep rolling, unrolling my, my paper, my canvas, my paper, my, uh, the film that I work on. I keep unrolling it and I don't crop it till I'm satisfied with how wide it should be because as I'm drawing the roots, I learn so much about the roots and I realize, okay, wait, there is, I, I can't return the same way I, my destination and my, I have to take a detour, yeah. I have to take a sea route now or I have to go via another country or, uh, so after doing that, I have to wow. keep my, sur my surface, my paper uh, uncropped, almost like a Photoshop. Up, uh, canvas which is uh, infinite um, and then I and I slice it off where I feel like my roots is concluding I anybody who works like that like I just know that you know most people have the surface they know that we have to work within this particular size and then they plan it but that's so interesting like so that in a way is the spontaneous aspect of it where it, that part of it is unplanned, right? You know what correct. you're making, but yeah, you don't that's know correct. when it's going to end. In fact, for my, um, for my thesis at Ruskin, um, I didn't, I did the same. I had a 60 yard, I don't know, it was a very long roll. And I kept unrolling and drawing on it and unrolling. And my route was from Multan to Baku in Azerbaijan. And it was really unfamiliar to wow. my tutors because they didn't really know where Multan is. Mm -hmm. And many of them didn't even really understand yeah. where Baku is. And uh, so these were my, <laughs> my point A and point B. And as I was going through them, um, I discovered so many aspects of that route that it kept expanding and expanding. Uh, and my, my accommodation, because I was staying in a student accommodation, was like a shoebox, a tiny, tiny room, yeah. as they are often. <laughs> so I never had a chance to unroll my entire drawing to view it. Uh, and I didn't know how it was turning out because my surface was translucent so if I would spread it out of the carpet yeah. the carpet was also coming through it so I could only look at it in chunks wow. on my desk which was okay. only like 150 uh, centimeter wide desk and uh, so uh, I only knew what I had made when I went to display it on my a day a few days before my thesis uh, exhibition and I un began to unroll it on a white uh, a, a surface and I started to see the drawing uh, for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. That's so interesting because like sometimes if you work like that, you're not sure if, it, if the drawing will come together well because you don't know the start point. You can't see the starting point. You can only see what you're working on. But just the fact that, you know, you're able to manage these beautifully composed pieces despite that limitation is, is really interesting. That's, that's very cool. Okay, so Sava, in terms of the projects that you've done uh, or the pieces you've made, is there any specific one, uh, either an exhibition or a particular piece that you're uh, particularly proud of and uh, why? Um, particularly proud of, I mean, every few years I will have a favorite and then I will feel like okay. I can't make anything more satisfying for myself than this piece. And then I will surprise myself mm -hmm. by having a new favorite so that has changed um recently uh, i okay. i have a show up right now at um uh i have a show up right now in um at lums in lahore uh, uh it's an unusual location for a show for me because it's uh it's a non-gallery space it's, it's, a, it's an institution um uh, but the show there yeah. which is up to the 20th um i uh i when i when i Put up my my pieces there. One of the curator asked me in you know, a She asked me that, uh, how are you going to part with these pieces when any of these sell? 
isn't it going to hurt when they when they go and i told her that 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 feeling never comes in the feeling of wanting to uh hold on to them is never there uh because i i am a prolific yeah. artist i i constantly make i have a lot of uh, flat files in my studio which are filled up with draw uh, drawers and drawers of drawings i have resin uh, cast curing as you speak on my left uh, and in containers behind me there's always oh. some work i've forgotten i've made and i've tucked away so i have so much so much are a draw so many drawings in my studio that i'm really happy to see them uh, travel and and find new homes um but in terms of my recent project i think i really enjoyed working on my most recent uh, one of my most recent researches which was on tipu sultan's uh, um, automaton uh, which is at, placed at the victoria albert museum uh, as a uh, tipu's tiger um that was a starting point i i have now moved on to his his uh, diplomatic missions as he has a lot of uh, outreach uh, yeah. used to trade and uh, had strong ties with in you know, Oman as well as in, in Constantinople in France so that part is very interesting for me mm-hmm. to research and study how his artifacts tra- traveled and where they are yeah. uh, uh, at this time and discovering them as i travel uh, in Absolutely. in different parts of europe so that is something that i'm focusing on right now and it's it's really exciting for me that is very interesting and, and and any reason why you have a particular interest in tipu sultan is it well i, I think i was fascinated by him uh, i always mean we always grew up reading about him in history books in pakistan and there's a lot of pride that uh, pakistan is also taking his legacy as a force of resistance to the british uh there's and they openly yeah. embrace him as a as a hero because of of course the most, most important fact that he's muslim and pakistanis love to uh, hold on to muslim uh, icons yeah. from afghanistan iran you know whichever part of the border they like to uh, take them on and ca- call them their own and for that reason we have so many streets in uh, islamabad in pakistan as well all over pakistan that are named after tipu sultan um but uh, yeah. i my fascination doesn't come yeah. from his heroism as a muslim force of resistance to the british um that part impresses me too but my uh, interest came from his artifacts because he had this really amazing style where all his objects had a tiger print the babri the t- tiger print embossed on them or etched on them or embroidered on his soldiers wore the tiger print and his tomb even right now has a uh, a uh, chaders of a uh, tiger print uh, draped on his grave uh, so that is almost like a versace logo which we all recognize tipu sultan's tiger print uh, identifies his objects even uh, to this day so uh, often i will come across right. an object um, and i will try and analyze it and as and if i see the tiger or the, the head of the tiger or uh, a very specific kind of tiger not just any tiger you we can identify that this was made at Yeah. his time during his sultanate and that oh. aspect of branding is something that really fascinates me as an artist that is is very fascinating that that really is i didn't know that and also in terms of your work like you mentioned that you have a lot of work that you have with you right now so do you just make all the time or do you make work for specific shows uh, sh- what is your and i make all the time i don't wait for shows because there was a time where i used to draw and paint for exhibitions or for representation or for uh selling or hoping that someone would that was very that was in the forefront at one time but something flipped and when my research started to become more important than uh then who is going to acquire it or where it's going to be shown when that flipped it stopped mattering the deadlines were personal and in that sense uh, i draw every day all the time i have a very strong uh, uh niyam i have a very strong uh, rigor in my studio where i have to go in every day and i spend like 10 8 to 10 hours really? in my studio every day and if i don't make it in my studio in the mornings i compensate by going it in, going in the evenings or also like uh if it's during ramadan if everyone's timings are already like all cuckoo so it'll be i'll be there sahur so time i mean i have to put in a certain number of hours in the studio uh 
for my own sanity because that this is my this is my happy place this is where i generate ideas and uh, feel satisfied that's really cool that i love that and okay so some of you live in dubai and but your work has a global reach um has living in the uae influenced your art and its reception i don't know why as you were in no. pakistan so i remember the last oh, time i really, I really like this new dubai. thing where I people are always confused of where i am like some some half of them think that i'm still in a uk it's not a bad situation to be in cuz it gives yeah. me a lot of privacy as well <laughs> to make and uh, spend all my extra time with my family which i value um but um, i do travel a lot i do yeah. uh, and i think i travel a lot because of where i am based it's uae uh when i was uh, moving to i so i grew up in abu dhabi uh, i was here up until the age of uh, 12 and then i moved back to pakistan and uh, spent my uh, all the way till nca in uh, in lahore and then i moved abroad again um i was in the us for 3 years and i met my husband and we moved to india and we lived there for 2 years yeah in new delhi um that's where i had my first child my daughter was born in new delhi um and then as we were being he's a lawyer so as he was being seconded to dubai i was like this is I don't I don't know if I want to move to Dubai. I am so happy in India. I I am I love being in the subcontinent. And um I met one of my really close friends who's also been a professor of mine at NCA, Masuma Sayed, and she was visiting me in Delhi. She was living in Delhi at that time, so she was visiting my place and she said that, "You know, have you heard of um have you heard of Art Dubai? It's a very new thing and it's just started last year and don't underestimate the art scene in dubai it's not like you remember when you were growing up there so i said i said okay well let's see yeah. and the year that i moved here uh, was i think the second iteration of art dubai and then everything just started evolving at an amazing pace there and then al sarkal avenue was established and then there was no looking back um so in that sense living in dubai wow. uh i i began by thinking thinking well i will not have access to my material my resources my conversations with the people the universities that i was a graduate of i was thinking i i won't be able to teach in the spaces that i would like to teach in but then i began to uh look around me and take stock of right what where am i let me be very aware of my location my geographical location and then i zoomed out on google yeah. earth and i saw okay i am in a country which is tiny surrounded by some very very unstable uh, countries and across the sea uh, and of course on the on behind me very very rich highly uh, well uh, uh, sort of very stable countries as well but across the ocean across the sea there are all my region south asia and then there is a lot of instability on certain parts so i became really aware of my geographical location uh and i started to see how can i benefit from this what perspective do i have that i should take advantage of what i am in a very very international city uh it's like the united nations of uh yeah. middle east um it makes you very very tolerant to all sorts of people and of people of different backgrounds um ethnicities and because none of us are UAE we are none of us are UAE citizens we are all residents we are aware of our identity we hold on to our identity really strongly as well um and in that sense uh i felt like i i gained an altitude by interacting with a lot of indians and and people from bangladesh and sri lankans and and uh within within the middle eastern region uh iranians and and so on and so forth yeah. and omanis and i and i felt like that gave me a lot of understanding of uh the differences and the commonalities which living in pakistan i may not have had access to um another very important point about living in uh uae uh initially i thought that you know my perception as an artist will be a bit filtered by the fact that dubai seems very blink and i will always seem that i'm an artist that belongs to a certain kind of privilege and then she is not in need of funding she's not in need of scholarships she is not in need of grants so i was yeah. very aware of, 
of that perception yeah. of myself as an artist um but then i we were because the the the, the art scene in dubai was evolving at that pace they began to offer so many grants and fellowships to long term residents in dubai that there was a point where over i think 4 years i had not spent a single dirham from my personal account to buy uh, uh supplies because like. there was some there was some foundation uh, oh. government foundation funding that for me uh, very happily wanting to do that um, my flat file in my studio documentation for my works for my new york show were all coming from different uh, uh, foundations and institutions like jamil art center uh within al sarkal avenue as well as uh, campus art dubai so that was something that i had uh, i began to uh, realize that there was something very new that started to happen um also it's something interesting right. i want to add is that dubai has a uh, is our airline emirates airline is really well connected but that's another thing that made me really aware of uh, access that i had of flying in and out and then i felt so so uh, stabilized by all of these uh, all this awareness that i can be here in this country and i can have access to so much without feeling like i am uh, yeah. displaced in any way yeah 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 absolutely. and and i think this answers narmeen's question really well narmeen asked that how does uh, your change of location how did it affect your work so that's a great answer for this as well um in fact it reminds me of a friend of ours a uh, friend of mine from uh, my batch who moved to riyadh a couple of years ago and i remember her being a little bit concerned about you know what the art scene was this was about 5 years ago uh it, within those 5 years there's been so much development in art and so technologically advanced that she's like shanzi like when i come back to pakistan i just feel like you know i mean like there's so we have such a long way to go because there's so much investment in the arts as well in saudi arabia now and who would have thought you know so i i feel like these they're really evolving and there's so many opportunities that are there in uh, the gulf countries and now said saudi that arabia what well. we have in pakistan is unparalleled i mean i i make sure i travel regularly to pakistan uh, my recent trip to lahore which was a few weeks ago unfortunately came after a gap of 3 and a half years yeah. because there was a pandemic and I was in uh, uh, in UK for my degree, and then my kids have uh, uh, need to acquire visas, and it's a bit tricky for them. Uh, but coming whenever I'm there, I try to align my visits with certain uh, festivals, whether it's the Fez Festival or the Literary Festival okay. or um, the Biennales, Lahore Biennale or Karachi Biennale, and uh, that's an opportunity for me to meet like a hundred people I know in one space in one day. so i really sort of used that opportunity to socialize okay. to the max but the conversations are unparalleled okay. the resources i mean you have the smartest people with the most amazing research with the most incredible skill set in pakistan i can only speak, say uh, uh, i mean it's it's just incredible it's just cannot in any way underestimate any talent coming out of pakistan just because they are living in a country which has uh, all these difficulties you know of really survival yeah absolutely yeah absolutely um, so so how can you tell us that you know you've you've exhibited in a number of countries so do you ever consider your audience when you're making work or is that not important or relevant in the creation stage i am really aware of my audience i have like a jury sitting in my head constantly on a bench and it's them <laughs> always there like I mean okay. they're they're become a little distant distant in my mind but uh okay. I would say initial okay. stages of my career I was really aware of that audience and my audience my audience is always uh, is mostly south asian um except for a few professors from okay. RISD who are still always in the in my mind when I'm making uh, I think about their reaction but <laughs> the rest of my audience is 100% south asians uh i'm interested in seeing their reaction i'm excited to see how they will engage with the works i'm excited for them to identify buildings that uh i i drew in a scale of 2 mm by 2 mm but they are there standing and identifying it and their excitement 
so my audience is 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 uh, is definitely my people yeah and when i say my people i i address uh, uh undivided india i address uh, uh king uh, civilizations from various uh, mm-hmm. ages and then i position myself in those uh, my i don't view the region as geographically divided as it is now in 2023 i look right. at it in various ages and feel the sense of ownership wow. yeah that's amazing and um sawa so basically so a lot of people some people who might be watching might not come from an art background they might not know a lot about art so you have received fellowships in partnership with the Rhode Island School of Design as well as the Paul Mellon Center for British Arts so to someone who's new to this world can you explain what is a fellowship and how may it impact or evolve uh, one's artistic practice first of all everything is not for everyone so each time we see an opening okay. or a call for entry our first reaction as artists is to apply for it because we have such a uh, such limited uh, opportunities to begin with but having said that everything is not for everyone we need to like really pick and choose on what we're committing our time to towards uh, a fellowship is different from a scholarship in a scholarship is uh, is almost always a uh, funding towards studying uh, in undergraduate or postgraduate level in the arts it's mostly uh, masters programs uh we rarely have scholarships for undergraduate programs for the arts uh for international artists i i i struggle to come across them but fellowships are are different in the sense that they don't necessarily involve uh, um funding towards an education they can facilitate your application at some point but they will not lead to admissions always in some fellowships they could there could be a promise of helping fund your scholarship a fellowship will have a time constraint and involve some sort of strong mentoring by educators that will be invited in to guide you in helping develop your practice and your ideas a fellowship will often also offer you a, a studio space and require a sort of okay. commitment for you to put in time to travel towards that location to work in that studio so one has to apply very carefully uh to these things to these programs to do justice to them because we can always put them on our cv and say we've done x y and z but to really benefit from them we really yeah. have to see whether we have the time for it or whether we have uh are, are we physically able to relocate and put in time in that studio space yeah yeah i see i see and then coming to uh the awards that you won there's it's just amazing so you won the vogue hong kong women artist award the uc berkeley south asian artist award the mansfield rudd prize and pembroke emery prize which are like out- outstanding dissertations or thesis at oxford right um firstly congratulations um and generally can you tell us um apart from your experience that how important are art awards and can you discuss how these accolades have impacted you know, your career uh, my first uh... award was my uh, vogue hong kong vogue uh, artist women artist award um and it was smack in the middle of the pandemic and they had they had emailed oh. me uh, and i had never received the email uh, announcing that i was a winner and i was just lying there in in the whole like pandemic uh, fatigue which we were all facing scrolling on our <laughs> uh and um i i received a phone call uh, early in the morning and they're like did you not receive our email i'm like no who are you and they're like well you just won the uh, vogue hong kong women artist of the year award and you are going to be on zoom in like half an hour and we're waiting for you to confirm for the announcement so i like screamed ran put ice on my face to like deep puff it was so early uh, i set up my studio cleaned it up came on wearing too much makeup and um, i at that mm-hmm. time when i received it i was excited by the monetary prize that it accompanied so it wasn't just like here's your crystal uh, award it was actually a 5000 dollar uh, prize which was really nice to receive in the middle of the pandemic and um uh two months later i received the uh, the bronze female figure um so that was also really lovely mm-hmm. to put in my studio um but 
what it does what an award does is it validates it's it's a it's a great form of validation and often women artists need it more than uh, than uh, male artists in our community in our society uh, especially if you are a mother and you are um plugged into a, a very busy uh, household and you're a daughter-in-law you're a uh a sister you're so many different people you different roles that you play that for you to carve out time in your studio you need to really like have something to show otherwise it's also yeah. porous that you know oh you're just home what are you doing you're just home so i'll just come by or you just come over you tum to fare hoti ho right you're just free so but the, the minute that you start getting awards and you start getting acknowledgments the your your space around you also widens uh this this the the space around you also widens and gives you more room to work more uh more professionally um and that's just how it is that's yeah. just how uh yeah. the society works and um they, the other awards at oxford yeah, were uh, quite a surprise they had two awards uh, that they had allocated for the best uh degree shows uh and I, I was a bit embarrassed when I received both of them because I was like um I I, I was okay with just one uh and I felt a bit felt a little embarrassed uh yeah. and one of them involved uh, a a solo show at, at Pembroke College Oxford has 39 colleges so two of them gave me the awards uh oh. so I went back in January and it, I had a blast I went back in January and they put up an amazing show they had they organized a talk with the history department and um, it was just uh, incredible going back wow. uh, to receive the awards um so it's definitely a high point in our careers as artists um yeah it's yeah, definitely really. a high point so and, and what do you think about so there are different kinds of awards um please correct me if i'm wrong there's some where you know for example you just find out you received an award you haven't applied for them but then there are other awards that have sort of open calls where you have to pay a fee to then come on board within the pool of artists that they're going to be selecting from do you feel uh, that both are equally valid and okay and it makes sense or do you think that perhaps either of these things you know, or maybe that that's such a brilliant question for young artists to uh, have insight into this matter uh we we all will do this when we are starting off we will apply to everything we'll apply to digital shows we'll apply we'll yeah. apply to online shows we'll apply to uh random shows in which we know we will be exploited we've applied to shows that we never got our works back from and they're still there we've written them off yeah. because we know that we're never going to going to get those works back so we've done it all and we can do it for exposure yeah. but this is where the exploitation comes in because yeah. you're going to get exposure um but it's really important and i'm going to go into a bit of a segue right now for students who may be watching now or at a later time when this is uploaded uh it's very important to be aware of the yeah. labor that you're putting in to elevate someone else's platform and if is it balancing mm-hmm. off with what it's doing for you and at what point do you yeah. have to determine that my labor is disproportionate to what i'm receiving in return so whether that is your monetary right. uh, contribution your the, the a very steep application fee whether it is you having to fly in for an award whether it is the framing charges which are uh, can be very very expensive for young artists you really have to create a balance and see and resist these demands and it, and it's very, very scary to resist yeah. demands because we worry that what if you get cancelled what if you don't get another show because we will be known as a right. difficult artist uh recently i uh, submitted my uh, a very large drawing it's called hindustan it's on the river it is uh it's around 7 feet wide and 4 okay. and a half feet high uh and i submitted it for a show in a, a competition in a, in london it's called the trinity wharf uh, artist prize drawing artist prize and i was shortlisted um but they it had made it very clear that the work should be framed when i submit them and when i went to when i found out the framing cost they were like over 1000 i think they were over uh they were over 1000 pounds to frame that piece i, I was like wow. no way am i paying 1000 pounds for framing this piece 100 pounds for shipping this piece to the center so i just sent 
put it on i i mounted it on fly and then i sent it in bubble wrap and i received a call from them uh, a week later that look you've shortlisted your work but you need to come back and fix this crap <laughs> it is not acceptable <laughs> and it's best for me and i said this is yeah. the best i can do i can't come and pick it up and i will not fr- i can't afford to frame it i will not frame this for your exhibition i'm yeah. going to create a resistance against that and the piece got selected and it's touring uk right now it went to multiple uh, venues and i was following where it's oh. right now is in jersey at a at a uh, at a, their center and uh, the most interesting yeah. thing was that um the, the most interesting thing is that i noticed in their instagram that they framed my work so i i was just so really? amused by the fact that they, they have framed my work and uh, I, i was like great you know i resisted and it happened uh, another example i'll share with you is that um i was uh, in a in a fellowship slash exhibition slash commission in which i had to uh, they were going to give me uh, say 5000 dirhams as an artist fee and they were going to give around 20000 dirhams as a production fee so you see the difference in the artist fee okay. as opposed to the production fee was huge um but my yeah. production fee is always like a pencil and paper right so i'm not get- getting things yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, fabricated or paying for uh, getting uh, you know huge mar- marble slabs or huge glass and people who do it it's amazing that they do it but i don't need that for my practice so i i got i went back to yeah. them and said listen i'll tell you what i want you to consider shifting your production fee into my artist fee because the amount of hours that i'll put into my my production are over maybe 1000 hours so i want you consider that yes. as my yes. labor of an artist and yeah. you will be promoting Absolutely. and nurturing the studio practice rather than fabrication of artwork which is really big in the buy you know get things yeah. produced or made from from um, industrial spaces i said i would be i would be um, i would be making them in my studio in my space creating a different kind of energy and they're like well, no one's ever said this to us it's really a strong argument and then they came back to me and they did it they actually shifted uh, funds around and they increased my production my artist fee so uh, uh, i'm just sharing these things that there is space for uh, resisting um, as artists um also i also want to talk about uh, when i'm talking about labor Uh, a lot of this these conversations i was brought to uh, was made aware of during my the fellowship that i did over the summer at paul mellon center where our main theme was uh, labor the art of labor and the labor in art making so all these things sort of opened oh. up in my mind that wow i put in so much time as an artist working towards other for other institutions yes. without any uh, compensation all the time for example uh, yeah. when i make my drawing say i spend 1000 hours on it then i make i spend time documenting it then i do a photo shoot for the press release of myself then i uh, yes. travel for the exhibition then i house my worry about my stay my transportation it is a huge expense uh, so Absolutely. as artists we need to be aware of how much are we willing to put in that and when do we start saying no you know even if it's an award exactly. and they're inviting exactly. me to fly to receive it it's not a monetary award i'm expected to pay my international yeah. flight yeah. and come and stay wherever i can find a space to stay but and then when i receive the award in, in the mail i have to pay a tax on it because you have to pay a tax when you receive something that weight and size in dubai so really? i need i need I need institutions to be aware of what we put in as artists, and we're already putting in everything yes. in our studio. So much, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember recently I had some exhibitions of I'm um, in Karachi, and I had them in, in Lahore and Islamabad. And I mean, there's a lot of money you put in. Like the material costs are quite high. They're getting higher by the day. Framing, and then you transport it there. and then often you have to if you want them back you have to pay for that as well so not every gallery pays for you for transport 
and I was just imagining that oh my god suppose these pieces don't sell some come in some cases they do some cases they don't it's just a lot of expense and then you know like you have to think about what are you getting out of it and in some galleries are great with publicity you know they're they're doing their job well there are others that aren't really like they you know there isn't enough press or they're just doing a half hour job so you're right and and more recently i've been thinking about this that how can we make make it just better for artists overall and and in fact i think the next question was uh, which i think you've answered really well Uh, which was that what advice would you give to younger artists who may be clueless about the art art world about how the art world works and you know who yeah, may be I mean, at the risk of being destroyed my first major advice would be <laughs> about having a very rigorous practice having a practice which involves a lot okay. of uh, involvement and honest investment of time um the whole idea that you do you and you are original and you are a genius because you're going to do you it doesn't really work it's it's actually very poor advice that we're often right. dished out at mfa and mfa mfa programs because we're not being prepared as artists to step out into the real world and then that's when we get disappointed that i'm doing me and i'm just not even able to buy milk at the end of the week with the kind of money i'm not making uh because of my lack of yeah. skill set so the rigor that comes with being in your studio every possible day there'll be days when you go to the studio and you will just uh, not be able to make anything but that's the day that you can have an admin day where you clean your studio you organize it you organize your digital files you r- respond to emails but that yeah. kind of commitment of time needs to be there um moving on to the second part of your question that how what advice would you give uh, young artists who would like to um uh, navigate the art world i would like to say that yeah. i think we ne- it's there's no formula and there's no manual you know so we even at this stage of my life i'm still trying to figure things out so many things are still such a mystery to me and i think many artists would still say would also admit yeah. to this um but it's very important to be really aware of your uh your the value that is attached to your art making uh, you have to really value it mm-hmm. um you have to follow up with people to right. get bring get your works back without feeling embarrassed that this conversation is yes. going to uh, uh, disadvantage you in any way unfortunately we have to follow up all the time with galleries to get paid which is a really sad uh, state of affairs because yeah. uh, in so many in so many careers you go to work and you come back and you get paid at the end of the month but we don't get paid for like maybe a year and a half later uh, uh, so it's a, and we're freelancers most of us and it's really um if you like what we do if you enjoy the kind of conversations we instigate if you enjoy the kind of images we circulate on social media if this is what is if you value this also be prepared to pay for this you know on time yeah as as young artists as well we shouldn't be shy about um about uh, making that uh, make, making that reminder putting forward that reminder uh the worry that we yeah. will get canceled the worry that we will not get another show uh your work will be strong enough you have to have faith in your own practice to to know that it will sustain you yeah 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 and what's interesting is to often um to people who are not from this field and who are just taking like a very you know outside view of of this field i get to hear things a lot of comments like oh it's so easy for you guys tum log ko jab jana hai go to your studio make work sell it for such high prices and then they're comparing their salaries ke oh we have to pay like hame the tax bhi karta hai you guys so don't even pay tax and then ye kya kya cheeze and a that's not true and b there's so much more to this you know it's not as simple as that because another thing i would probably add to you know people who are getting to the art world is that another thing we're not taught is how the monetary side of the art world how to sustain yourself as an artist you know um, there's so much focus on how to create art which is great and how the conceptual aspect but then if you want to survive as an artist yeah. you need to sell your work how do you do that you know how do you and how not just sell your work but how do you keep evolving uh, and kind of reaching your goals you know yeah, I um do you have any thoughts to, to say about that? that actually like when i graduated from risd i had a bit of a loan uh, i had 
uh, departmental, I had a grant that they gave me, and then I had a, a small amount of loan that I also taken out from my master's, and the rest my mom had uh, kindly funded. Um, but as soon as I graduated, a few years later, I began teaching as an adjunct instructor in a AUD in Abu Dhabi, in a, uh, American University in Dubai, and I taught there for 13 years. And uh, within the first few years, I repaid my loan with by just setting aside my entire salary to send off in dollars. Luckily, Dubai and uh, dirhams and dollars are pegged so that there was no fluctuation. And I was able to quickly pay off my loan. Right. Um, but that teaching twice a week was a real support to me because we were a young couple starting off and I was supporting my practice and my husband was had so much other to worry about. So I was just, I needed to make that money to sustain my practice as well or my travels for shows and things like that. Um, and, you know, you can be in fields like, you can be a banker. It is really tough being a banker too, don't get me wrong. But you can be a dentist and you can be a mediocre dentist and you could still survive. Or you could be a mediocre banker and you could still sort of have a stable career. But it's almost impossible to be a mediocre yeah. artist and survive. Because there you have have to really aim high to remain in the limelight or remain relevant or remain uh, uh, significant in your field. You really have to aim really, really high. You have to have fresh works. You have to have yes. exciting works. You have to have works that are archival and uh, works that are, are traveling internationally. And not only that, you have to be there when your show opens, standing there bright and fit looking and be engaging and clever. And there's so many layers to this profession that uh, it's such a difficult field to be in. It is one of the most difficult fields to succeed in. Yeah. You're so right. Because it's not like you have, you know, in other fields, you you know what the next benchmark is and you know that there will be promotions. There's a whole set, like, you know, system. We don't have that. And we have to keep creating those benchmarks for ourselves, like deciding that, okay, this is my next goal. How do I get there? And then kind of trying to weave your way through and again, because there, there are no set rules. You have to figure it out yourself, you know. And I feel like a lot of people don't like using this term, but I think a part of the art world is being like maybe it's not the best term but networking is also a part of it and by networking it means you know kind of sort of being there for other oh, artists absolutely when, you know, absolutely um, mm -hmm. uh, they be there for you um being in the so how, how do people get to see your work you know you go to galleries um you're seen there that's a whole process you show your work to gallery owners it's it's also not as simple as just emailing galleries with your work. Nobody's no. going to reply, you know. Yeah, that we've is, all done that. Yeah, yeah, we've all done that. No responses. Then again, you know, if you want to create uh, more ambitious works, if you don't have the funds, you apply for funding. You apply to different places. If you want art residency, you keep applying, and you'll apply to hundreds, and you might get like five or something, or maybe a little more than that. But point is. There's a lot of effort and people uh, from the outside don't see that. So you're absolutely right. And uh, and yes, some great comments coming here. All artists make their own benchmarks, know how to do it. Yeah, uh, so they true. no so manuals true. out there. But as you mentioned, mentors are really key. Net and your big yes. part of a network is so important. And, you know, we have this negative perception of, uh, of like, oh, uh, you network. And as if as if networking is like a, a, a very ch chalak thing, or networking is something very uh, something yeah. which is very like uh, tactful. There's a very sometimes there's a negative association to networking that some introverted artists can promote. Yes. But and many artists are introverted as well uh, yeah. in in a in a way. Um, but I think in most in most situations, networking, unlike if you if you have to un like rewire our thinking of what networking is, it's not. Wearing high heels and clicking uh, a glass at an evening in, in a party. That, not, that kind of networking is tedious, boring, irrelevant, superficial. But networking in terms of when your friend is showing, go to their opening. When, when they are, uh, when they are uh, holding an IG live, attend it. When they, are, uh, when they do something and they tag you, share, share, the, share the love. 
um and uh share resources as well i know we are all really busy but like share resources think of collaborations um also give back or pay pay it forward uh and you may not necessarily give back yes. to this the foundation that gave to you but you could pay forward by by maybe contributing to someone else's travel funds in a, in a small institution in your home country or whether it's mentoring artists who are much much younger than you who don't have the privilege of traveling as much as you travel yeah. have not been in an international institutions doing their masters so share that intel uh, with them and i really love speaking to young artists um in pakistan i taught one year at uh, one summer at bnu as well uh, twice actually two summers once online and once in person um i really enjoy i really enjoy engaging with uh, young artists from my community uh, and students from my community because i really value the, feed, the the mentoring that i received from my professors which has been unparalleled yeah. in the world the kind of uh, uh, love and associations i created at nca it, it is just unparalleled yeah yeah, yeah. they are still there, still with you there. With i recently uh, my curator at uh, loves uh, fatma shah she posted uh, uh, she shared a photograph with uh, risham said uh with ali raza ali raza sahab and um noshin said my professors sculpture painting and print making professors all in one frame looking at my work and I'm, and i was just like misty eyed because i was like where will this ever happen <laughs> like will this ever happen at, at rist will this ever happen at ruskin that my professors will all show up so readily i mean they would they would if they could it's hard but in lahore it's a small place and and uh they they do they do show up uh and it's just uh, really uh, uh, really heartwarming that's that's wonderful that's wonderful and um i think one other thing is that you know as you said share information some people have the mindset that they should withhold information so that their success is guaranteed and nobody else comes in but the fact is there's enough to go around and the more you share the more good will come back to you in other ways so i think as artists we should do that as well that you know if we see someone up and coming who's promising and they want your help or advice give it to them you know there's space for you and for them yes, as well yes absolutely shanti uh, this uh, it's very so elastic that, our field is very our our arena exactly. is very elastic and it expands to incorporate new artists all the time there was a time when i used to feel that oh no i'm running out of time x y z have made it i am still I haven't done anything grand yet or this person has won this abroad prize and I, i it's it's over now you know i've missed the boat but every year there's another opportunity every few months there's another uh, opportunity to to prove yourself and the more the, and society needs yeah. artists and they will always continue to need artists and new artists and artists Absolutely. with new work so there's always going to be space for new artists and new work to uh, emerge yeah. and uh, be elevated at different heights yeah and there's no time limit or age limit to this either so my father he basically was a civil engineer and about let's say 12 13 years ago he switched his career completely to fine art so imagine at that wow. age and now wow. he is a full time mm-hmm. artist so from him i that we were the ones who limit ourselves he didn't know anybody in the art world so he made uh, those again networks he got to know people and now he's What? exhibiting It's more than a story that is <laughs> so, very I mean, inspiring Thanks. So it's, that's great. Okay. So, and Sabha, what would you say to people uh, who would who don't consider an art career to be important or valuable? And you know, sometimes uh, younger people say that, "Oh, my parents allow me to do art to pursue for a while." Do you think it's something that is um, sustainable? I think, I think it's a difficult course, a difficult line to take if you don't have the passion. So, I think it's important for yeah. us to guide. students in the right direction if if they don't have the passion for this field they will find it very disillusioning they will find it very uh, isolating and and painful to have a want which is so strong but a lack of 
passion or talent to match it so it's important to guide students uh, uh, honestly as well not blindly right. encourage just about anyone in this field unless you see that they have the grit for it um i i was for many years uh, the the alumni chair for rist in the gulf and once in a while i'd receive a call from a parent saying oh my my child wants to apply to rist and uh, they gave us your number to get feedback from you as you were in dubai what advice would you give and i would say that look if your child is going to cry if you tell them they can't do art only then they should do art <laughs> because this is a really tough field <laughs> uh to begin with it's no less than studying ppe you know in in a in a in a in a top university it is a very tough field so make sure you have the commitment and the drive for being super self motivated uh to set your own uh yes. deadlines uh, irrespective of yes. institutional deadlines uh y- if you have that ability know that this field is for you but if you are a person who needs to be regulated by other people and other institutions then uh, think about more corporate uh, style jobs because this is going definitely the parent those parents may also have a very legitimate point that this field will lead to a lot of heartbreak because they will not have the grit or the the commitment or the discipline yeah. to pursue it yeah absolutely grit is the right term you need it to survive in this field absolutely do uh and you need to be able to drown out the external noise when people are telling you suppose there's a low point and people are like what are you doing with your life <laughs> you need to be yeah. able to push through um and someone can you tell us no i was the, agree sorry, with you you were saying something okay okay um sabha can you tell us about any strange funny or ridiculous incident you may have had while working in the art world or maybe clients or somebody who has acted strange you don't need to take names i think uh, i have had many strange experiences uh, but the most unpleasant one in my field are when people uh, uh are in position in power based on their proximity to more important people ask you for free works or favors which is very uh, Uh, which you feel really compromised because you feel like oh if i say no they will um they are in position to guide my next event and yet they are asking for something which is very difficult for me to do at this point so i i feel i find that very uncomfortable uh i've had to like tell certain people in my who have inboxed me who are my colleagues from nca that look you need to stop asking me for free works it began as a joke but now i'm i get anxiety every time i see your messages where is my free drawing where is my free drawing it's to, after a while stop stops being a joke and it starts to become offensive that you're not valuing what i do you're not taking it professionally i will not ask you to give for a free consultation uh on anything because this is your profession absolutely it's happened with me as well like i have a couple of people i know who it's like a thing acha when are you giving a small gift and i'm like i have given you a lot of art gifts but it's it, it's almost taken in an offensive way that wait are you like showing throwing attitude that you're not going to give us any more artworks and then i've said this that would i would never ask you to give your whatever you do your services for free so why yeah. you, you know it's 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 been it's a thing now but earlier on i would uh, and i still do i still give people things if i want to but when it becomes an expectation that next oh gosh birthday you need to give me a painting <laughs> or make portraits I or make portraits and i am very yeah. making portraits don't get me wrong yeah. but how much time would that take me to make a portrait for your child or your sister yeah. for their birthday when um it's so busy it is so hectic Absolutely. but I, i mean i think uh, i i have i'm pretty good at saying a polite no now i've become better and better at uh, uh maintaining boundaries um uh but it's still Great. it's it's often uh, you once in a while you come across an awkward situation where you're expected to put in time with a very little return and then you're trying to ask that uncomfortable really? question that am i am i getting paid for this or i just have to do this because you are a friend of my friends so it's just like very surprising that there yeah. will be an expectation that you will be doing a, a, a free collaboration free work without compensating being compensated for yeah. your time So um you know what told my uh, acquaintance of his 
कि यार माय पेंटिंग्स बहुत एक्सपेंसिव है सो मैं तुम्हें एक कैनवास और पेंट लाग दे दूंगा तो उस पे बना देना लाइक ही थॉट दैट बेसिकली माय डैड इज चार्जिंग फॉर द कैनवास एंड द पेंट ही लाइक आई गिव दोस टू यू यू जस्ट मेक अ पेंटिंग एंड गिव इट टू मी आई वाज लाइक ओह माय गॉड पीपल हैव अ लॉट टू लर्न व्हेन इट कम्स टू दिस यू नो अम तो एनीवे आई थिंक this is i think a part of our career is also to educate people on how this world works and what's you know i was speaking to uh, um, salima ashmi about this recently she was here for uh, art yeah. dubai and i was speaking to her about this and i was telling her that you yeah. know when people ask us for free works do they not value what we do and when people in power ask for free works do they does that mean that they don't value our time and she said something really interesting she said that it's not that they don't value your time they are from a different their mindset is from a different century altogether when artists wouldn't sell yeah. and artists would show uh, in one or two spaces in alhamra or these uh, very very um, sort of uh, sterile uh, sort of spaces and they would not sell much so they were very happy to gift yeah. Yeah. one or two pieces at the end of the show to the institutions and not really feel uh, 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 like it was a, any big deal for them uh, so she could, it's just, just a mindset is is different yeah. uh, it's from a different time and different generation because now things have changed a lot artists maintain their careers based on how they they share their works show their works and how they teach about from their own practice based on their practice so um that that she was just uh, she she brought it to my attention that it's just not not valuing your work or your time it's also a different mindset and in which i suppose what you're saying is really relevant that educating people yeah about your labor exactly. is very important absolutely and this is also another assumption when it comes to artists that they are eccentric and that they're moody and they're perhaps unable to handle the realities of life and they're lost in their own worlds and then i see a lot of educated people with this mindset you know the nay nay wo to artist hai usse to nahi karna hai ya ha wo to or at her pace she does whatever she wants or he does whatever he wants so he's perhaps incapable of doing other things in life because his work is so based on you know his own decisions that's again another thing which is so wrong because we're handling more than one aspect we're not just creating and we said we're marketing we're networking we're building we're creating our own goals and our own futures in an But uncertain you know shanti that you know? is some, somewhat true as well you will come across we will come across many artists from within our community from other even even if you travel to a different country where um, where people but other artists will uh, work on crip time or they will spend the time to suit their needs and not uh, work towards other people's deadlines and they will miss out on deadlines they will miss out on replying to emails we i i come across people like that all the time uh, artists like that all the time it's a very common thing in our field actually and often i also come across people who say to me that wow you know you're so professional or you're so such you respond so quickly uh, that it's um, that it's really uh, refreshing uh, in your field to see artists responding so quickly and you are so organized artists are not so organized so it is a problem in our field i feel like a lot of artists uh, do not um, work at a certain pace and it could be because of uh, it could be because of our, our creative process i don't know really or just lack of professionalism or a combination of both things but it is definitely a, it is a bit of a, a a situation in, in our fields where where they do live artists do tend to live in their own <laughs> self created worlds i suppose so you you're right i think maybe my perspective is limited because from the friends i know in the art world who are pursuing art all of them are organized and they're you know very diligent with time and they're very much they're doing other things and doing art at the same time So you you're right I'm sure uh, there are people like that as well and maybe in every field but more so in art so that is probably true but I think again generalization is is yeah, very much there that every so like from like uh, my batch so, in NCA uh there I think there's only two of us who are still making art from our entire uh, painting department really? uh and, and if you expand to the entire fine arts department 
I can count on my fingers how many are actually still practicing artists. And often I feel like mm. uh, opportunities are lost because of delayed responses. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so writing back yeah. in time, on time, is quite crucial. crucial in in our, our field as well absolutely you're so right um and sabha can you uh, name some artists who you really admire or who are oh uh, yeah i i at one point i was under a lot of pressure to name like white dead american artists or european artists <laughs> to be to to come across as informed and you know uh, intellectual and well well read but i'm i many years of go i realized that that's not doesn't that's not true for me i i look at my own mentors for a lot of inspiration i um i i really really admire naiza khan's work and i uh i've learned a lot from her her professionalism and her research i also like appreciate and enjoy a lot of um, works by uh, rishan said and bani abdi and uh, huma bulji i find them all very intelligent artists um in terms of mentoring uh, uh Salima Hashmi has been my guide for many years and I not only look up to them for uh guidance in my practice which is not something we often talk about but it's it's more about like I watch them for inspiration as a mother who is a art educator a mother who went to who was an artist as well uh or who went or women or as women right. who as mature students went back to university and how did they balance all of that out so i i pay attention to these details of their lives more than talk about right. my work or what do you think of how my practice is going It, it's more about how do they navigate their daily routines is what i um take as i look towards them for inspiration that makes sense and generally i feel that uh, also apart from mentors i think people and friends around you often have an impact on 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 a person as well like often i i derive inspiration from my own friends even if they're in different fields you know just seeing their work work ethic and you know their determination ambition all of that and how much they love what they do and that sometimes inspires me in in my career as well uh and and you're so right i mean looking at people not just with respect to the work they do but how they would you know they bring everything together how they manage everything in a beautiful way i think that's such that's a learning experience as well so that's that's wonderful and uh, i i saw like a mini reunion happening at the nega art awards where you with mrs harshni yeah. and you know other it was really wonderful it was a really wonderful event <laughs> yeah and um so sabha with you know with the uncertain political and economic situation uh, like ours in pakistan what can artists do as a response and do you believe that we have the responsibility uh, responsibility to do something or respond in a certain way or is that not necessarily uh, important we all no matter what our professions are we have a responsibility to engage and respond to uh situations that are political of political crises in nature or economic crises in nature or civil disobedience or what have you I think we all have a responsibility to artists have a yeah. larger responsibility than others. I don't think so, but we definitely have a louder voice when it comes to sharing ideas. So in that sense we have have a platform yeah, that we true. can use uh at a timely manner to talk about injustice in society. Um but whether we do yeah. but whether we should our response should be urgent and immediate is something I'm not so sure. sure about because it may come across as being disingenuous uh, in our uh, desire to elevate our platform for uh, by using a more a very prevalent situation as a as a catalyst so i mean i i, I would i would say that what really must respond but when they respond and whether that response should be immediate is not necessary i feel you know it can i remember at, at the time of uh, September 11th yes i'm that old um everyone around me was you know many i should say everyone many artists around me were responding to the burqa and the the image of the planes crashing into the towers and there was a lot of that language that came into our uh, our uh, art vocabulary from pakistan uh it was because it was such a it was such a hot 
situation for us we were in in deep knee deep in all of that um but it was difficult for me to respond to it you know i i didn't feel like i could engage in that, that even though i was in providence rhode island at that time and i was i was i was victim i mean i also felt like i was uh, had racist slurs shouted at me and i felt self conscious as a muslim there but i still at that time i just couldn't uh, engage with that or incorporate that visual language in my works um yeah i think you you need to be true to what you're kind of feeling from the inside if that's something that has impacted you and you you feel the need to bring it in your work then one should but if not then it's okay and these things might come later maybe even years later you know your experiences will come into the picture and then you can talk about them but you're so right in the sense that i don't even i feel like if something is happening around you you don't need to force it in your work just because you're an artist but i think some professor told us that whatever your your art is a product of your surroundings and experiences so even if you're not intending it or making an effort for those things to come in they will come in in some way or the other without you even realizing it so i think that's something that we can kind of keep in mind um but yeah so sama we can now move on to the final segment of the interview which is the rabbit fire and uh, these are just like very short okay. quick answers okay. so so sama if you could wake up as someone else for a day who would you choose to be oh my god but that is a tough one um i guess i'm just so happy being myself <laughs> i'm so like grateful every morning that i'm sama i'm an artist i um, i'm i'm i live with my family here and i'm so grateful for it that it's a tough one to answer i yeah. um i would definitely I mean, if you ask me if you ask me that if i okay, could be in a different which era i would like to be i could answer that for you i mean uh-huh. i'd love to be transported teleported yeah. to the 18th century i'm so fascinated by that time period <laughs> i know that's like a, that's like a, a lot of years that i'm, I'm highlighting there but yeah mid mid uh, 18th century onwards i would be very very happy to be in south asia and any or in a particular uh, location I, i would like to be maybe in delhi at that time you know <laughs> <laughs> and a uh, food that you could eat every if day if i could if i was al- medically allowed to if i was yeah, yeah. medically yeah, allowed right. to eat yeah. a food every day it would be nihari oh, is on nihari oh, really <laughs> oh my god yum that's true <laughs> okay awesome um a dream you have with regards to your career i uh, i think my only dream for my career is to never stop drawing no big goals apart from that okay that 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 that's good um and how do you overcome creative block uh, if you ever have it i i never have that i never experienced that uh, a medical uh, what do you call it uh, um an artist block but uh, oh. i think when people reach that point in their practice it's time to sit back and read a little bit and uh, sort of uh, chase your medium a bit you know um okay good advice um who is your current favorite new pakistani artist this question actually i intended to mean like you know like either television artist or a singer or something but you can answer even in terms of like a visual artist if you want it's up to you how you oh um this is also another t- tough one um upcoming uh, you know i really enjoy pakistan tv and uh, i find some of the actors on tv really uh, really talented and i really enjoy uh, watching them uh, on uh, tv as well and I'm, i'm not sounding very intelligent right now but let me see um I, maybe i can come back to this on uh, and post it under yeah. my video how's that I- Okay man uh, I I know I put you in the spot. So okay so who oh, what is your pet peeve? What I get bothered by? Um 
I guess my pet peeve is uh, people uh, getting late. Yeah, because I value mm. my time and I want other people to value my time. Sorry? Do you face? I don't know if. Yeah. Do you face oh, yeah. that in, in Pakistan? Yeah. Not known. when I'm in, in traveling abroad yeah, or anything like that. But Pakistan is like, I'll come between eight and nine. I'm like, what? Give me, give me a minute, like eight <laughs> or five. Or but I understand it's not everything over there is not as con- in control <laughs> as it is yeah. in other parts of the world. Exactly, exactly. Like I have a friend who lives in uh, Jamaica, and I remember she would set calendar dates week weeks before for us to have a video call. And I told her eventually, I was like, "Look, that's not possible because our lives are so unpredictable that something might pop up." And so let's oh just decide gosh. a date. Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> that's true and it's the same uh-huh. with my friend who lives in india she, the gym to have like meeting with me and the indian friend but me and the indian friend could relate with the bit where we were like we're not in control of our time so we cannot decide weeks before we can't put wow. that time uh, uh, i see i suppose that would be that is so difficult for me because my days are so scheduled um, yeah i I can't be spontaneous. Yeah. My calendars are planned like weeks in advance. My socializing, I need to know if I'm going out on that day or because I have like so much happening with the kids as well and their schooling and uh, so it's just so hectic for me yeah. that uh, I need to like pencil everything in uh, and my travel plans that as well. Sense. Yeah, so Zoom calls have to be on time. I'm a bit inflexible like that. <laughs> That makes sense. Uh, here also, like when it comes to work, I'm, I know that people have their calendars kind of, but maybe because that was a conversation probably, that was more yeah. casual, so it, it's also in it, you know, the weightage level is different. Um, any advice you'd give your younger uh, self? Uh, my advice to my younger self, um, I, I, I guess, uh, I wish that when I was starting off as an artist, I did not. Um, think so much about my um i i wasn't so self conscious is what i wish i i i could undo you know i wasn't so self conscious about what i'm making or how it looks or how it will look in an exhibition i wish i was more spontaneous and uh, yeah because it just broadens the the possibilities okay. of your practice I, no, I, I remember like after graduating, I thought that everything that I present, it has to be you know set in stone and people will remember it forever, can't make any mistakes. But that's not true either. You know, you can make mistakes and then sometimes artists even change their work completely. And, and I think that's fine as well, if that works. Um, what scares uh, you? Like physically? Okay, I'm scared of fungus. Anyway, I don't know what happens. to me i'm oh, really? super scared of fungus and mushrooms i eat mushrooms but if i see them growing from oh, somewhere really? i just like i'm so freaked out by fungus or anything that grows uh, on something that it just shouldn't be growing on <laughs> like termites oh, termites oh, fungus oh, it just freaks the heck out of me so i get it this fear which is sort of related but not completely which i think i have it's called trypophobia if i'm not wrong it's the fear when you look at a visual or something yeah. that has tiny yeah. dots in it and you yeah, feel like it iphone, it. Yeah. so the, i think that, yeah and i looked it up and it said that it's i think it's something very like biological inside a human being that that thing signifies like that visual signifies that there might be some i think see. threatening living How inside those dots yeah the whole feel like disgusted because it's just um the gentleman says you should watch the last of us what is it. that i just ah, watched hello. the pilot i also like i'm fascinated by slow moving zombies so everyone knows who everyone knows who knows me know that i watch everything with slow moving zombies <laughs> not the fast ones <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting and some of the final question for today is what makes you truly happy um what makes me truly truly happy is uh uh when i am in the middle of a drawing it, it makes me it's my is the middle of really? a drawing middle. because as soon as i'm done i feel terribly disappointed and terribly like 
self loathing but, and like all of that is satisfaction but the most satisfied i feel i think happiness comes from satisfaction as well there's some connection and i feel like i feel truly satisfied and happy when i'm in the act of uh, mark making uh but it has to be the continuous act yes. not uh, the conclusion of it right but how amazing also and kind of like a privilege that you know you're you're so sort of known for what you love to do and you know the act of making is such a joy for you that in itself is so amazing and for everybody who's able to do that as an artist i think it's a privilege right in many ways and um that's amazing so saba uh, any thing else you would like to say anything at all to anybody who's an artist or people out there any last comment you'd like to make um, to wrap up i i just i would just say that uh, just keep uh, keep keep trying so what you truly believe in i know people say this a lot but it's really nothing is truer than this statement that uh keep at it uh but work smart uh towards your goals you know and try to learn from people who have already achieved those goals similar to yours to see what kind of strategies can be uh, adapted or sort what kind of resources could be tapped into not just alone in your room in the dark praying for some sort of uh career path to yeah. emerge for you but actually following uh and and taking advice and, and putting yourself out there and taking risks are so important because you can be really safe and cozy and never look stupid but uh you may also not achieve uh, what all you set yourself for in doing that absolutely you're so right um sabai it was amazing talking to you i like it was it was so fascinating just to listen to your work making process and your ideas of how you know one can become a successful artist and to just keep at it and i truly truly hope that i get to see your work in person as well because i am a sucker for details i love detailed work and when i saw your pieces and i just zoomed in i was like oh my god the details are never ending so i love them and i really hope i get to see them and see you in person as well again it was amazing meeting you at uh, the niga awards and it i felt like i'd known you for longer than that um and thank you so much for being a part of this conversation really enjoyed talking to you i'm sure everybody listening also had a great time and also thank you to everybody who kind of put in comments and asked questions um this is going to be uploaded on on instagram thank and you, on Shanti. youtube as well thank you thank you chanzi um, so i actually enjoyed myself as well take care then okay take care bye so glad